Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out to Creative Mornings Oakland. I'm your host, Yvonne Lima. I'm a local designer here based in Oakland as well. Thank you for coming. I know it's early, but I hope you'll get something really great out of this today. So maybe today after the talk, after you get some uh, really great inspiration from Francisco and Vogue here, you're going to go out and do something great in your careers, in your designs, in your creative works. So. Some of you may or may not know, our theme today is hidden. So in hidden form, we put you guys in a nice little cozy environment here with OSA, Open School for the Arts Black Box Theater. So I hope everybody's caffeinated and ready to go. We're going to get started. Without further ado, I really want to introduce our guests today. They represent TDK Crew. They've been around the street art scene for ages, and they've been doing some original works around town on murals, on facades of buildings. You probably didn't even know it was them but now you're gonna start recognizing them. They promote respect for the community, respect for the art scene, and promoting positive things within Oakland and outside, hopefully spreading to the rest of the world. They're world renowned and locally respected and revered. Please help me welcome Francisco Sanchez and Vogue. How you guys doing? Uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming out this morning. My name is Francisco Sanchez and I've been practicing uh, graffiti art for the last 16 years or so. Um, I started sometime in middle school, and, and now to think back and kind of look at the transitions that I made from like tagging on every desk that I probably sat at to you know, doing large scale murals and then doing a lot of commission uh, work now, um, it, it's a trip to me. Um, I've also, I also teach at a high school right down the street. I teach at Oakland and Milano Zapata Street Academy right on 29th. I've been doing that for the last seven years. And it's, uh, it's great for me to, to give back. It allows me to give back to the school that allowed me to graduate, gave me that chance, and, and to keep pushing our culture, which is the gra graffiti art form. And I'm also part of TDK uh, crew. I was uh, asked about 11 years ago to join TDK, and it was an honor for me because I grew up looking up to these guys. It was established in 1995 by uh, Mike Dream, who passed away in 2000. And um, the original meaning for TDK was those damn kids. I'm assuming that was just the reaction that the older folks got when they seen graffiti on buildings or whatnot. You know, they'd be like, those damn kids. So that was the original meaning. Um, after Mike's passing, we're using now the Dream Crew in his honor. Um, and, and again, for me, it was, it, was, uh, it was an honor to be part of TDK and asked to join, because I, I, I grew up looking up to Mike and, and Vogue, which is here uh, today to add commentary throughout the lecture. So. Hi, uh, my name is Norm, also known as Vogue. I've um, been painting graffiti for about 30 years now. Um, one of the first West Coast to start. Uh, everything migrated from New York to here, and everything before that was just uh, gang graffiti. So it's without something new and fresh. Um, uh, along with Mike Dream, you know, he's the one that brought me into the crew probably in the late 80s, and uh, we kind of built built this up to be something as a hot started as a hobby and then realizing that someday we might be able to do this art as a career and uh, as as years pass it seemed to be a little more accepted and a little more easier so the word writing we call each other writers like people that practice graffiti or that, that take part in that culture we call each other writers we don't say like what do you graffiti we say what do you write I mean essentially the word graffiti itself translates to writing Right? So, so just to clarify that, you'll hear us say that word, um, and I wanted just to put that out there so that you guys know we're referring. Um, a writer is someone who, who just does graffiti or her uses a spray can as a medium. So as far as my involvement, like Vogue mentioned, he was one of the first generation of writers out here in the West Coast. I came mid-90s, you know, like 95, 96, and uh, I didn't get influenced through Beach Street how a lot of these guys did, or, or you know, I, I wasn't spinning on my back in the 80s or nothing like that. Um, the way I got was influenced was a little different. So this is actually a photo of my, uh, my older cousins and stuff from the neighborhood. I grew up in Oakland, and I grew up in a gang neighborhood. Um, and my, my, one of my cousins was actually a gang member. So looking up to him, that was the first time I ever seen someone use a spray can to do something other than to paint a bike or something like that. Ever since I was small, I knew I wanted to do something art related, right? I just didn't know what medium 
or what to use. So wh when I seen a spray can used to draw things, even though it was tagging the, up the neighborhood, and occasionally they would draw like characters on the side of the freeway or whatnot, I kind of transitioned to that. So um, that's how I got my start into it. Yeah, my involvement was you know a little bit before Francisco's, but very similar. Um, just riding bikes in the neighborhoods, just seeing things all urban, street, um, I took notice. And once my bike career kind of ended, as I got older and the, the wave kind of died down, I decided to focus more on my art career. And then I watched a PBS documentary on Channel 9 called Style Wars. And that's when everything kind of took off. I really saw that that was something I wanted to try. I always did art, but, um, you know, pencils, acrylics, whatever, it wasn't really my thing. So spray painting seemed that you could take something, a household good from your garage that your mom and dad used to paint like the patio furniture or engine block of a car. We could try and create something nice out of it. It's funny how a lot of people are quick to dismiss our art or, or, or what we do um, just because we use a spray can. You know, a lot of people don't understand it as a medium. Um, and a lot of the times when we're going to get gigs or people, we're showing people our portfolio or whatnot, they tend to like everything until they say, okay, what did you use to paint that? And when you tell them you use a spray can, you can see it in their face like, oh, you're one of those guys or, or something like that, right? One of my mentors growing up was Dunn TDK. The description that he gave me for what we did hit the nail right on the head. He said uh, that graffiti was the pit bull of the art world. So it's misunderstood, it is admired from afar, but it's feared. It's funny how people like stuff that's finished, but when they see us doing it with a spray can, some of them we, we, we kind of turn into new fans, but some of them they don't, they don't respect it just because of the medium that we use. So I think it's very crude. Right, right. Um, not understanding, and that's the part of it. It's misunderstood. We kind of wanted to give you guys uh, a little history about like where graffiti came from. It came out of the hip hop movement in the 80s. Actually, there's some disputes, people saying that it came out of Philly, came out of New York, and, and lately now there's been disputes about people in LA saying that it started with like Cholo writing in the 60s. So there's this whole debate behind that. But it came out, out of New York as far as what we do as you know, writing. It's pretty much like all we had in California was gang graffiti, um, Cholo writing. Um, that's all I grew up with. Um, and I think this just took it to another level where you were able to develop color, characters, but in, in our form, it was all about the, the letters. And that's one of the things that people don't understand. They, they just look at the wall and they go, oh, I like all that, but what does that say? And, you know, it's just the development of a letter style and we tweak our own alphabet. Um, and it's kind of like our own little subculture. And then that subculture kind of turned into like my family. So like I consider Francisco like my family. That's, and our general family is TDK. I think it also gave young people the voice to, to promote a message that they wanted to, to promote. You know, if, if you had money back then, of course you could put a billboard or whatnot. And, and we constantly see stuff we don't want to see. You know, you're, all, you're constantly bombarded with billboards that you don't want to look at. Um, but they're in your face. So it kind of gave that outlet to young people as well. Um, even if it was just writing their name, um, it, it gave them that I'm here voice, right? Um, Empowerment. Right. This is what people usually like. Portraits, colorful pieces, whether it's on a truck or whether it's done illegally sometimes. As long as it's pretty or colorful, people tend to like it. All this is done with spray paint, by the way. To compare it, I guess, to other art forms, people don't understand that graffiti or, or using a spray can as a medium it's completely different than any other medium in this sense. When you're drawing with a pencil or a brush, you can feel the surface that you're drawing on, right? So if you wanted to say, I don't know, get a darker line with a pencil, you would just press harder. If you want a lighter line, you'll just release the pressure. With a spray can, you're essentially drawing in the air. We don't ever touch the surface that we're painting on. So you know, if you wanted a cleaner or, or a smaller line, you get closer to the wall. If you wanted a broader line, you gotta go slower and get farther away. So people don't ever see that aspect of it, or they don't, they don't understand it. Because even if you were to watch me, and in, in, in a little bit you'll watch me outline this piece over here, you won't necessarily see that I'm never touching the surface, even if you were staring at my hand, right? Just because we've been painting for so long and we, we, you know, we know what we're doing now. But um, people don't give us that credit. And that's one of the things that we're here to try to educate you guys on that stuff. And then also some of the stages that it takes. So a lot of people appreciate this but they don't ever get to see all the stages that it takes to get to this point. So a toy is what writers that have been doing it for a while call the newcomers. 
When someone starts out their first few years, they're considered to be a toy. But it's not necessarily a word that we use to, to put someone down. It's kind of a word that we use because at that stage you're still playing around. You haven't found your niche. You don't know what you're doing yet. But we take those kids under our wing and then show them, okay, if you want to get to, tell me where you want to get to. And, and, and it's funny now because now that I teach and I see kids that actually like graffiti, I try to take them through this stage, through these stages, I'm sorry. Um, so a toy is simply that. It is someone who, who just started doing this and, and wants to, to develop. The first stage after you start should be tagging. This is usually the stage that no one likes, right? right. No, everyone sees this, it's in your face, it's on billboards, on the freeways. I tend to tell people, and parents now ask me, you don't promote the tagging, do you? And so I, I always try to explain to them, like, if it wasn't for this tagging, I wouldn't be where I'm at now, right? So this kind of helps you transition into to, to, to the next stages, and it also helps you with penmanship. It helps you master your, your signature. It helps you create your own fonts. It gives you a loose hand, because if you notice, every tag that's up there is, is completely different, right? So it, it makes you unique. It makes you stand out. And, and um, it's a necessary, it's an essential part of graffiti. There's a lot of writers that, or, or I don't even want to call them writers, but a lot of people that get into graffiti um, later on with skipping out a few of these stages and we can see it because when they sign their work They don't have nice penmanship, right? So we can we can we can see that yeah, they jump um, ship. Yeah They'll go to school for art and possibly you know study and try to master you know their acrylics and their uh, Sculpture and whatnot, but when it comes to graffiti art It's something that can't be taught really in the school. You could take some of the applications of color and structure and uh, composition and translate it over, but this is something that has to be learned by going out there and doing it. Like practicing on a piece of paper is only eight and a half by 11, right. but when you're out on, the, on a wall and you have a spray can that sprays your name five feet big, I mean, yeah, then, then you get to the toy part when, you, when you're first <laughs> out there. It's just gonna look horrible. I don't care who it is. Nobody's going to go out there and kill it the first time. So it takes practice. And so repeat of tags, what you see in the street over and over and over again, develops a can control style and technique that leads on to the things that you see um, that, that everybody likes. You know, a lot of people like, like the canvases that we could paint, these photorealistic canvases, the big murals that we do. But again, I try to always tell people this is where it all started. Yeah. So can control is just being able to, to pretty much control that spray can. Um, just like you would any other media or any other utensil, a brush or stuff like that, right? You see Vogue up there doing a fat cap tag, as we call it, which is just a broader tag, wider tip. Different nozzle. Right. The second one right out at the bottom, the pink one that says dream, that would be considered more of a straight letter. A straight letter is something that's readable. It still has a little bit of style. And in my opinion, it's one of the hardest things to do because it has a lot of straight lines. But because it has so many straight lines, even to people that are looking into the, the culture from the outside, they could tell whether a straight line is crooked or not, right? So this is kind of where you get, you define your can control. And this is when you realize, okay, should I move on or should I st stay stuck at this stage? And a lot of kids do. A lot of kids don't pass this stage. And that's another thing, back to the tagging, uh, when parents ask me, like, my kid likes to, to use spray paint, I let them know, well, let them, let them try to develop it. About 90% of the kids that, that touch a spray can give up. Like, they'll last like five, six years and that's it. And it'll be just a small amount of kids that'll make it to, to the end. Bubble letter is just an extension uh, on the far right. It's an extension of your tag or your signature. It's just a bigger blown up version. So it's to be seen even more. So instead of scrawling on a little pole on the side of a stop sign, then you're, you're going bigger. And then, then, then a lot of those kids venture out to freeways or you know billboards or whatnot. That leads from there to the straight letter. Right. A bubble letter, that's what people know it as now. Initially, we called it a throw up, and it comes just, just like the definition of a throw up. It happens quick, so that, that's pretty much the, the... In and out. Yeah, it's like you should be able to do it two, three minutes. It's a throw up, so it's quick. It doesn't have to have any style. It doesn't have to look nice. And this is, again, what's, what has become really popular right now. So you guys see a lot of these bubble letters everywhere. And, and to us, we want to see the kids move past that. Um, once you move past that, then I think that's when you know that kid is really in it for the long run. And for me personally, I, I really don't pay attention to too many youngsters doing it until they move past that level, because that shows me that they want to move forward and evolve. Some people never leave that, that, that tagging and bubble letter throw up stage because they, that's their high. They may mm -hmm. not even do drugs or drink or anything. That's their way of 
you know, empowering themselves and letting other, their peers know because it, it started as a, uh, you know, a niche group. And so it didn't really matter if like the general public cared, it's it, you cared if your peers cared. And um, they may never leave that area because of artistic ability, but it's, they're high and they just want to see how, how far they can take that. Whenever I see a tag personally, I don't necessarily dismiss it or look at it with disgust, right? I, I see the potential that can possibly be there. So, yeah, I see a lot of these kids, some of them are toys, like, like I said, what we call toys, um, but I want to see them in 10 years. Like, there's certain names that I see out now that I'm like, okay, I want to see that kid in, in about 10 years, see where he's at, and, and uh, then maybe we could take him under our wing. Um, and who knows, maybe they'll be part of our crew in the future. Yeah. That's why we don't dismiss anyone. Right. And um, that's just, how you got in. Right. So that's where I started, and then <laughs> I, was asked to, I was asked to join TDK. So the next stage would be like a, a piece. So a piece is just short for like masterpiece. More bends, more movement to your letters. That's what we call style, right? I'm pretty sure a lot of youngsters now use the term bars. So that term comes from graffiti, right? We break down each line to a letter into bars. A lot of kids don't know that even where I teach, I tell them, you know that term you guys are using for like, oh, I have bars when driving. That comes from graffiti, right? They're just saying I'm good at driving. And a wow style piece, it's, it's kind of more, it's harder to read, and it takes a, um, someone who's been doing graffiti for a while to actually be able to read every letter. So the bottom one there, that silver one that says dream, that would be considered a wild style piece, just because of all the connections, all the bends and stuff like that. So a production is more of a mural. It has a theme behind it, it has a background, and everything's connected somehow, right? Usually it has a caption. Everybody paints their name, but it's a circus theme and the caption is East Meets West. This particular wall was painted in 2010. We titled it East Meets West because we had half of the guys on here are from New York and then the other half are from here from Oakland. A lot of the confusion nowadays with the youngsters is that they, they think just painting next to each other is considered a production and they don't realize that it takes more than just to paint next to each other with the same colors for it to be considered that. Um, so that's where we're trying to actually move back into the culture of like taking youngsters under our wing and, and showing them all this because they're misrepresented, like I said, um, so it's, I think it's our obligation to do that now. So as far as motives, we kind of broke it down into two different motives that people do or, or pick up a spray can or decide to continue writing. So the first one's individual expression. A lot of people are stuck at the stage of just tagging or promoting themselves. Initially, that's where it starts, where you get hyped on like the attention you get from your peers and from everyone else. So some kids just stay there, right? So that's one of the, uh, one of the motives. And that's kind of like the motive where everyone starts off at, right? And as you get older, and you evolve as a person, you kind of start seeing the world different and stuff like that and start evolving in your message as well, you know, just like any other artist would. Um, so you start moving into like mass communication and cultural, cultural stuff like that, political statements, doing um, rest in peace, pieces for, for people. Um, the one at the bottom that says tax dollar skill, that's actually Mike Dream right in front of it. And that's another acronym for TDK that was used back then. And it just kind of represents how our tax dollars fund wars and stuff like that. And this was done along the tracks here in Oakland, and we consider the tracks to be like a gallery of sorts, right? Where a lot of kids go there and see a lot of new pieces and get influence and stuff like that. So the new art scene in Oakland, this is Art Murmur that happens here every first Friday. I love that we have something like this in Oakland, but I don't like that it's called the new art scene, right? So we've been around since 85, or TDK has been, and I know of a lot of other artists, even if they paint in oils, acrylics, or whatever it is that have been around in the city for that long. I think the problem is, that a lot of artists from Oakland don't necessarily have the connections. Some of them might not have the, the art degrees. And with a lot of people moving into the city now, I feel that it's, they're getting more of the limelight. And a lot of murals painted in Oakland are actually mm -hmm. done by a lot of outsiders, right? So our goal now is transitioning into helping other artists from Oakland or, or our crew being able to paint and represent the city the right way. We're trying to make that transition into moving, into having us work with communities and paint murals that will represent the city and the history of the city and stuff like that. So <clears throat> Oakland is, is the theme that we're working on. The theme of murals that we're actually transitioning to now, for the past three years, we've been working with property owners here in Oakland specifically that get their buildings vandalized and repeatedly, repeatedly. And now there's an ordinance in the city that if you don't paint over graffiti, I think they give you like a week, you'll get a $325 ticket. They're starting to enforce that. So now we go around and we, we kind of look at buildings that repeatedly get vandalized and talk to the owners, make them aware of that, and, and we work with them to paint murals that are represent the area where the building is. Um, this mural's been up for about three years now. No, 2012, I'm lying, two years. It's been untouched. Um, it doesn't get destroyed because of the reputation that we have with the community and with all the younger generation of kids who write, or 
taggers, as people would call them, right? So when we put up TDK, it gets respected and doesn't get touched. This is another mural. This, this one's pretty big. It's about two, two stories tall, over 100 feet long. It kind of represents Oakland's resilience, and then it's located at Mandela Parkway in 18th. If you guys are familiar, that's where the Cypress Freeway used to run, and this particular corner is where the freeway used to turn. So we took a reference photo. Um, this is an actual photo that we used as reference of that corner. That particular corner, uh, a lot of people died because that's where the freeway collapsed. So we're kind of you know, showing in memory, uh, in memory of those people and showing the resilience of Oakland. And again, all, all the murals that we paint that will represent um, Oakland will be titled Oakland Is. And then the bottom will kind of signify that area where, where the mural is painted. This just shows the growth. And I think when we painted this mural, a lot of people just didn't know. They came, they were, came from other towns. And they, they would walk their dogs or eat across the street at Brown Sugar Cafe and come by. And, and what, why did you have this? And so we explained to them. So it's kind of like a small history lesson. Yeah, so painting out in the public allows us to educate a lot of people both uh, about the city, some of the history that the city has, and about graffiti culture itself, right? Um, they've never seen the mural. They say, oh, we always just see them come up, but we never see no one actually painting it. So it gives us that opportunity to show people, and sometimes to give little kids a try. Like whenever I paint it, there's some kids that are like, oh, how do you do that? I'm, you want to try it? I let them try it. So it's, it's a good feeling. This is one of our last projects. This kind of represents the loyalty that Oaklanders have for the city, their teams, and stuff like that. This particular project, we partnered up with Oaklandish and a few other local businesses, and then we opened up like a GoFundMe page to make this possible. But again, this building was repeatedly vandalized. The guy would paint it, and it wouldn't last a day or two, right? So now that we worked on it, it's been there for a few months, untouched. And again, it's because a lot of the kids see that we put TDK crew and they respect our crew and what we do. All the projects that we do are self-funded. We're looking for partners or people to fund our, our projects just because it's getting a little expensive on our end. Um, uh, but we constantly work with youth. I teach, like I said, so I try to bring kids out to help me out with these murals. Just make them proud of their city and say that they worked on that mural or whatnot, right? Thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.